Let me ask you this. Who's going in the Hall of Fame? I just heard about Easy e going in the Hall of Fame. Is this, this is big news. People were saying the, the guy who tried to put them out of business and now they're putting him in the Hall of Fame. That's right. They just announced this past week he will be one of the class of 2021 into the Hall of Fame, the WWE Hall of Fame to specify. And yeah, and here's the thing: why they are putting him in the Hall of Fame in in for one aspect to call attention to the fact that he failed in putting them out of business, aren't they? Isn't that another way to look at it? Well, to the victor go the spoils. Yes. Uh, and boy, is Eric spoiled. Um, but no, in all seriousness, besides the fact, I believe Eric Bischoff should be in the WWE Hall of Fame. That's probably the only wrestling Hall of Fame he should really be in because specifically to his role in the WWE and their their growth and success, he played a big part mostly when working against them, not necessarily as much when working for them. But if you... Go ahead. Well, go, go ahead. I was going to say, gonna... but if you consider the WWE Hall of Fame, look, the WWE Hall of Fame is a fucking joke. Well, I know. Pete and what Rose I mean is and Drew Carey and whatever. Yeah, we we know. This, I understand but... it's an honor and people feel honored to be inducted that Vince just chose their name that year to put them in. So I'm not taking away the feelings that the inductees have. But in terms of the actual process, it literally is Vince picks who goes in just on a whim. This year, yeah. we need a few guys, a main eventer, a woman, an African-American. Well, no, no, and no. And then we no. got our class that year. I mean, it's... Hold it's... on. Hold on. Yeah. No, that is not a Vince whim. That's a Vince directive. Well, there you go. Who fills those spots. Are, there is a legitimate quota that you've got to have the one or two main event ticket sellers. You've got to have uh, a woman. You've got to have somebody who was deceased. Uh, uh, you've got to have... Uh, a person of color, you've got to, have, you, there's a few boxes, but then within those, Vince chooses. It's not really a whim. People pitch people. And then he either decides on those or he has a whim. So it's it's both things. But And sometimes it's nuts. Like he refused Pat Patterson when Pat Patterson wanted Ray Stevens to go in. when they had, In San Francisco. In San Francisco. And Vince wouldn't do that, which, I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, I mean, why not? You put Abdullah the Butcher in Atlanta. You could do Ray Stevens in San Francisco. <laughs> but but anyway, the the thing is, I'm not going to disagree with Eric Bischoff going in this particular Hall of Fame. Um, that, that's what I was going to say, though. I was going to say, if you look at the WWE, if you actually try to find a way to justify who gets in and, and why, and you say it's for the stars of WWE, and if you look at WWE as the company that swallowed up WCW, they own WCW. They own all the intellectual property. They own the videos. They own everything. Bischoff, forget about him as an executive, as an on-air personality. Yeah. Based on what he did in WCW, but he was even better on air in WWE, to be honest. I think there's, you know, if you were trying to make a legitimate argument for this Hall of Fame at the directive of Vince McMahon, there's the argument. He was an on-air character. For both companies, he was well known amongst the casual wrestling fan and the person watching every week. The thing that Eric Bischoff excelled at was being a television performer, playing a crooked, smarmy con man executive. Imagine that. Uh, and it's, I mean, you can make the typecasting jokes, but no, he was excellent at that. For the people who say, but he beat the WWE 83 weeks in a row, or he did this or he did that. Let's say every other piece of Eric Bischoff's career was the success came from him being able to talk him, people into giving him chances to do things that he had never done before and had no idea how to do. And if he walked into Vern Gagne's office and, and basically he started selling advertising for the AWA, right? TV ads. He was selling, he had a game, a Ninja Star Wars. Uh, watch, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> thank God George yeah. Lucas didn't sue the shit out of him. <laughs> but Ninja Star Wars he had. And then because he looks like John Davidson, look him up, kids. It's hilarious if you ever, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 
But he looked like John Davidson. They put him on TV because they hardly, it was the dying days of the AWA and they'd lost most of their great announcers. They put him on the TV when Larry Nelson went AWOL on a cocaine and alcohol binge. Well, yeah. But the other funny thing I always found is when people would talk about Bischoff, people who didn't like him typically, and they would say, this guy looks like a game show host. Specifically, he looked like one game show host. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like just a generic game show host. No, he looked like John Davidson. That John was it. Davidson. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But anyway, I mean, we're, we're not even slagging him off here. He's told these stories, right? And from the AWA, he's there. And, you know, he's the, what, B or C announcer or whatever, and he gets the chance to go to Atlanta because he has people fabricate letters for him telling the folks at Turner who knew nothing about wrestling that he was more integral and experienced and important in Vern Gagne's operation than he really was. I've spoken personally to one of the people that he had fabricate one of those letters that had worked for Vern for a while on the theory that that guy would then get a job as soon as Bischoff got in down there and that didn't happen. But did, um, he, did he, and I know who you're talking about and I'm guessing you don't want his name out there. Well, I don't know if he wants it out there. But, but did he falsify, because it's one thing getting hired as a commentator, he was hired as like the C team commentator. Because you had Jim Ross, then you had Shivani, then you kind of had the the Gordon Soley, Eric Bischoff level. Because Gordon Soley by that point wasn't Gordon Soley of ten years earlier, so he wasn't even hired to be like a main commentator. He was just a guy right. there. Were the notes falsified then, or was it when they got rid of Bill Watts, or when Bill Watts quit, depending on who you talk to? Okay, well, yes, you are. He he got the the C team spot as an announcer, and then padded his resume to to try to to, to pitch the getting the executive job. Uh, but the point is, then he did pretty much fuck all or nothing until he accidentally had to blurt something out to Ted Turner, and he's told that story, and then he had to figure out how to do that. But then once that he got him to open up the checkbook, um, you know, and, and 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 spend money and go head to head, and then he steals the invasion angle from Japan, and then he's got a couple of years where he's got most of the giant stars in the business and an open checkbook and fucking runs with it and then fumbles the ball and fucking crashes nose first. At the ten yard line, <laughs> and and loses more money than, than any wrestling promoter ever the, before he even or in between the times that he was home and they were still losing money, he lost more money just the time that he was in charge over the last year than any wrestling promoter or year and a half wrestling promoter in history had ever lost. And would they have canceled WCW? If they had only lost ten million a year, as opposed to whatever it no. was, sixty million a year. No, because that was that was programming. But when you get to sixty million bucks, they could get a whole lot of goddamn sitcom reruns for sixty million dollars. Anyway, so then that's where he was able to at least shine in wrestling for the period of time. Because when finally Vince brought him in, it fit. He was the smarmy con man executive that that the crook that tried to fucking put him out of business. And he's a wonderful heel television performer, character, speaker, etc. It's the only thing he's ever actually in wrestling. He's had a number of jobs and that's the only one he's done well. Because all the people talk about what a success he was as a revolutionary groundbreaking promoter. He fucking he was a fence post turtle. He accidentally blurted out shit uh, to to get to where he was, and then he fucking stumbled onto success and then could not maintain it more than two years. I mean, you know, you measured success in the wrestling business, in, in at least in the old days, by longevity, because everybody had their shit periods. But <laughs> Jerry Jarrett said, for example, he said he didn't consider anybody a success or a failure until they'd been in the business for 20 years or so. Then you might actually see something. But, uh, you know, so, uh, no, I don't think Eric Bischoff was a good announcer. I don't think he was disingenuous and unlikable because that was his natural personality, and that's why he was such a great heel. Um, he was a lousy promoter because he 
as I said, he falsified his background and talked to people who didn't know any better into getting into these jobs, thinking that he knew what he was doing, which he didn't. And then he lucked into some shit and then he fumbled it. But then coming, <laughs> coming into the WWF as the, the asshole that tried to take him out of business and just being allowed to be a heel prick con man in a wrestling context, he was a natural and was, has, has basically lived off that ever since. And what a stupid decision it was. You're finally bringing Eric Bischoff. You know, they blew it with the invasion. There were guys they needed that they didn't want to pay, so they didn't bring him in. And then Bischoff comes in, whatever, a couple years later. The first thing they have him do on TV is hug Vince McMahon. That well, was your course. That was yeah. your opportunity right there. Who could challenge Vince McMahon? Who could put a fight to him? Eric Bischoff. And then you could do something. But instead, they they had to well, but belittle Vince him in a sense and make him under Vince McMahon on TV as a character. But at that, here's the thing. And I see I see where, where you're going and I see what they were doing. Vince at that time was a heel. Eric Bischoff could not come in and be the baby face against Vince McMahon. He might have, but it wouldn't have been that good. Um, but he could and, have been a bigger heel to turn that heel. No, baby because face. in, in the scheme of think about this, I said, Eric Bischoff was a great smarmy heel con man. Vince McMahon at that period of time, Mr. McMahon was still the best heel character possibly in the history of the business. Um, and they did not think that Eric Bischoff or anybody else was important enough to switch Satan heel just because one of the devils wants a run as a heel. Um, so they had to make Eric subservient to Vince. And I see where you were going to. It would have been great if either Vince was a baby face or whatever that, but, or, or just not be aligned. I don't know, but I see where the, they weren't going to fuck with Mr. McMahon to bring Eric Bischoff in. And remember, he'd never worked there before. They didn't know whether they'd get fed up with him in fucking three months and kick him out. And then what had they done to Vince? So I can see why they did what they did there. When they got rid of him as an on-air character, maybe I'm wrong. It's been a long time and I haven't rewatched this since it first aired. Didn't they do like a fake trial where Vince was the judge? And they decided that he was going to be let go. And then oh, they God. threw him in a garbage truck. I, I don't Am know. Am I wrong? <laughs> I, I don't know. Cause I never watched any of the shit. Really? I do, I would, I've seen clips of Eric Bischoff's heel promos at various points in his career. But I, I was not watching that shit on a weekly basis. 